fascinating new result from the Katrin collaboration, who managed to get a spectacular limit on the mass of neutrinos. Arguably the most important particles in the universe. Yet scientists don't even know how much these ghostly particles weigh. Hashtag fail. I blame myself. So do I. Physicists recently got a better view into the complex science of neutrinos and found that they're losing weight. That's a good thing, but it needs to get even better. In the beginning, let's start with the beginning of the neutrinos, which actually doesn't begin with a neutrino at all. It actually doesn't begin with anything at all. Now how can I have some more of nothing? You're killing me, Smalls. It began with the absence of something. Let me explain. When physicists first observed a phenomenon known as beta decay, the process by which the atomic number of an element can change without its atomic mass number changing, this can happen in a couple of different ways. Inside the nucleus, a neutron can decay, ejecting a negatively charged electron, and it becomes a proton. A proton can eject a positively charged positron, becoming a neutron, or a proton can absorb a negatively charged electron, becoming a neutron. But in all these interactions, no matter which one, beta decay will one way or another change the element which we're dealing with. It'll change the atomic number. There's loads of different laws that describe in incredible detail how these kinds of particles interact, transform, carry charge, and what their masses are. Their physical properties are incredibly important, and this has been known for almost a century, but it wasn't fully understood the role that other particles besides the known neutron and the known proton and the known electron played. It was in fact conjectured by a missing ingredient that there had to be a new particle it seems like it should be easy to detect a whole new particle. After all, there's only 17 fundamental elementary particles, and objects like protons and neutrons aren't fundamental at all. They can decay. They're not elementary. But it turns out it wasn't so easy after all. Particle physics is hard enough to understand mathematically, but it's even harder to account for all the other deficiencies and lacunae that are encountered when you go into a physics lab. On this channel, I love to talk about experiments. Experiments that reveal the truth or falsity of different conjectured theoretical models. By the early 1930s, it was clear that something else was going on in beta decay. The ejected particle, be it an electron or a positron, was consistently measured traveling with a velocity and trajectory, and therefore kinetic energy, that just didn't align with one of the most closely held concepts in all of physics, conservation of momentum. This stumped physicists for quite a while until Wolfgang Pauli made a revolutionary realization. If there were some neutral particle that was also ejected by this decay, it would be able to account for the missing energy, the missing momentum that was observed. It wouldn't have any impact on the effects of beta decay on the charge of the nucleus. As for why it hadn't been detected yet, Pauli posited that it was a non-interacting particle, one which left barely any trace on the apparatus or even on the rest of the world. Physicists didn't really take it very seriously. And in fact, Pauli said he had committed a cardinal sin. He had conjectured something that could never be measured. Well, he couldn't be more wrong. In 1955, physicists Clyde Cowan and Frederick Reines managed to detect antineutrinos being shot out of a nuclear reactor. Suddenly, we knew for a fact that radioactive decay could eject these non-interacting charged particles. And it would follow that natural cases of decay lead to natural sources of neutrinos. Thus began a decades long search to find neutrinos directly and examine their properties. The more we know about them, the better we'll be able to describe how they interact both on Earth in nuclear reactors, in the sun, in other suns, and at the early universe's birth, the Big Bang. The initial conjecture was that neutrinos were actually massless. In 1957, the nuclear physicist Bruno Patacorvo posited that neutrinos may oscillate between different states, called flavor states. You see, there's three different flavors of neutrinos. They correspond to the so-called leptons, the electron neutrino, the muon neutrino, and the tau neutrino. These different flavors of neutrino correspond to the different types of other actors in the nuclear reactions being considered. For electrons and positrons, it's obviously the electron neutrino and its antiparticle, the electron antineutrino. What Pontecorvo predicted was that a neutrino could actually oscillate between the different flavors, from electron to muon, muon to tau, tau to electron, etc. This is called flavor oscillation. 
It's been measured quite often since then and was instrumental in the awarding of the Nobel Prize to Kajita and McDonald. The neutrino flavor oscillation problem not only solved the mystery of whether or not neutrinos could have uh, non-banishing mass, but it also solved the so-called solar neutrino problem. The solar neutrino problem is the failure to observe the expected number of, say, electron neutrinos coming from the nuclear reaction that takes place in the sun. Those were not detected because these flavors can oscillate. So if they were originally produced as an electron neutrino, it could oscillate into a tau neutrino. And then if your experiment could only detect electron neutrinos, you'd fail to observe any neutrinos whatsoever. It was known now that neutrinos had to have a non-zero mass. So this was a great discovery. And it not only solved the solar neutrino problem, but it also led to a prediction of what's called a lower limit. Now, a lower limit says to a scientist that a given quantity cannot be bigger than a given value. An upper limit says it must be lower than a given limit. Now, the combination of a lower limit and an upper limit eventually converges on an actual measured value. And that's where we come to the Katrin experiment. The Katrin experiment stands for Kalstra Tritium Neutrino Experiment, and it's based at the KIT, which is in Karlsruhe, Germany. The Katrin experiment is focusing on examining the trajectories of outgoing electrons from decaying tritium atoms. Tritium is a heavier isotope of ordinary hydrogen with two neutrons and one proton. When the tritium's nucleons decay, they can discern the precise impact of the massive neutrinos on the electron's energy. Researchers were able to work towards getting an upper limit on the mass of the neutrino, which combined with the lower limit from the neutrino oscillation experiments paves a way forward. Not here or here so much, but right here. Now, how does Katrin work? It actually uses something that sounds like a wrapper, the Mach-E filter. This detector system takes the jumbled mess of outgoing electrons emitted from beta decay, and they straighten them out into an easy to measure, relatively slow moving beam. By making sure that the beta decay electrons are going in the same direction, they can control for any unwanted interactions and make do with measuring just the energy. And that's what the electrostatic filter is for. It screens out the low energy electrons, which would otherwise possibly contaminate the experimental results. We all know the most famous equation in all of science, E equals mc squared. That says that mass and energy are equivalent to one another. It actually comes back to haunt us in a certain sense. We want to know the rest mass of a neutrino, but at the incredibly high speeds that neutrinos are ejected from beta decaying atoms, a lot of that rest mass is actually in the form or converted to energy. From neutrino oscillation experiments, we know those masses of the neutrinos are incredibly small, or else we would have detected them by the experiments that set upper limits. So they're traveling very close to the speed of light. It's very hard to steer or control them. But because the electrons and neutrinos are so closely linked to the energy released by the initial decaying atom, the tritium atom, if we slow down an electron and measure its energy near the end point of the distribution of its energy spectrum, we'll actually get a really good approximation for the maximum rest mass a neutrino could have. And that's what the Mach-E filter is there for. What about that tritium atom? Well, tritium is just a fancy name for hydrogen-3, which is a fairly rare isotope of hydrogen, highly radioactive. One of the neutrons inside of the tritium atom releases an electron via beta decay and becomes helium. The electron and neutrino that get ejected by this process have a really low endpoint energy, which, as we've just discussed, makes them ideal for measuring the rest mass of neutrinos. Across multiple studies, the Katrin researchers concluded that they can be 90% certain that the neutrino's rest mass must be less than 0.8 electron volts, where physicists use the unit of energy divided by the speed of light squared as a proxy for their mass. An electron volt is a unit of energy based on how much a single electron accelerates from rest in an electric field impressed upon it of one volt. For reference, an electron has a mass of about 511,000 electron volts, yeah, a neutrino is almost a million times less massive than an electron. It's incredibly small. It's the lightest of all the known elementary particles. For the first time, we've broken the so-called one electron volt barrier using an experiment on Earth. This is fascinating because it paves the way for future laboratory or Earth-bound experiments to make more and more progress. 
Now, I should note that cosmologists and astronomers have broken the one electron volt and left it far behind for almost a decade now. And upcoming experiments, like the Simons Ray, the Atacama Cosmology Telescope, the South Pole Telescope, and the Simons Observatory, and eventually CMB Stage 4, will all constrain or detect neutrino masses. And so too will our colleagues that work on optical telescope surveys for so-called baryon acoustic oscillations. Experiments like BOSS, the Dark Energy Survey, DES, and the Euclid satellite can also detect or constrain the masses of these mischievous ghost particles. So, will neutrinos stop losing weight? Stay tuned for the next weigh in. And don't forget to subscribe to my mailing list at briankeating.com for fascinating messages every month about the exciting world of experimental astrophysics and particle physics. If you want to learn more about neutrinos, click here for this special playlist that I made just for you.